Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Today, things in Project Utopia get a bit darker and a lot more not safe for work. So be forewarned. And now, on with our story time. Chapter 9 Listen, Tracy, honey. It's very important that you select a good stripper for Bruce's bachelor party this afternoon, Charlie winked. Yes, of course, sir, said Tracy, as she rolled her eyes. She understood quite well what he meant. She watched as Charlie sauntered back to his office, and she took up her favorite pair of scissors, marked, for Tracy, the best clone we've ever had. They were a special gift given to all the clone employees. She liked picking them up after Charlie gave her such orders. He made her angry. He was a pompous member of the firm, and sometimes purposefully cruel. Worse, Charlie was fond of reminding her that Bruce had a woman he intended to marry. Bruce had been her lover just weeks ago. She remembered vividly the night he had worked late and called her into his office. They had made love passionate, wild love, with torn clothing and bruises on their thighs from the hard wood of his corporate desk. He hadn't looked at her since that night, but she knew he was secretly hiding his feelings for her. She could tell by the way he refused to meet her gaze. She smiled to herself. He was in love with her, and every time he walked by her desk, she could tell that he wanted her just like their incredible night together. She fingered the scissors as a smile crossed her lips. Bruce would be hers one day. She just had to get rid of his stupid fiancé first. She cursed to herself when Charlie had pushed his office door closed. Sure, she'd find them a hooker. She smiled to herself. This created new possibilities for her. Maybe she'd just have to tell Bruce's precious fiancé that a prostitute was at the party. That would get rid of her. At the Intelli Inc. penthouse, Charlie waited impatiently for everyone else to show. He was pleased, as usual, with Tracy's hooker selection for the party. Today, they would be enjoying the fabulous Martini, a clone taken as an original from one of the most enthusiastic obedient women in the city. Martini stood tensely in the corner, talking animatedly to her big, burly chaperone, Stephen, son of Dr. Jones. Her movements were sharp and quick, as though she was getting upset with his words. Charlie felt his breath catch in his chest as he watched the stunning beauty. With her long, blonde hair, small waist, and skin-tight red leather outfit and matching thong. She looked like a vision from his favorite men's magazine. After shoving Stephen out of her way, she gave herself a little shake and demurely adjusted her brassiere. She began to move about the room with practiced grace in her thigh-high red leather boots, preparing for her routine. He imagined touching her soft, creamy white skin and pressing his face into her full, luscious breasts. She pushed her long hair back from her face, and her breasts heaved up and down in agitation as she cursed at Stephen, who had come up beside her once again. Charlie licked his lips as her nipples nearly popped out from her brassiere. He gawked, hoping they would. He planned to get his share of the action tonight, whether his boys liked it or not. He loved Samantha and all, but she wasn't fun anymore. She didn't have sex appeal. She didn't have what he craved. Not like Martini. He shifted his weight in irritation as the chaperone prepared to leave and take Martini with him. In a huff, Martini slapped Stephen on the chest with the back of her hand and told him to wait in the corner. She was the kind who took her job seriously especially with such important clients, Charlie mused as he watched their interaction. Looking rebuffed, the chaperone scowled and turned to grin lewdly at the cocktail waitress. Rolling her eyes, 
Martini gathered her bag and moved off to the corner where she could take out her things in preparation for her dance, an evening of seduction. Charlie stared in fascination as she rubbed lotion onto the exposed flesh of her legs. It stunned him to witness such a private, womanly moment. The cocktail waitress approached Charlie, eyeing him instead of the grinning chaperone. He felt Stephen's glare, but turned his attention to the beautiful woman before him. As she pressed in close to him, he caught a whiff of the apple scent in her hair. We're ready as soon as Bruce arrives, she said with a wink. She held a tray of full shot glasses in her delicate hands. Charlie took two shots and downed them, not taking the time to savor the liquor they held. It was up to him to keep an eye on things tonight. He ran through his mental list of guests as he took another shot glass from the tray. Harrison would be coming, though Charlie despised the red-headed man but had always been a little nervous of the way Harrison kept a hand on the large, ornate knife he latched to his belt. And he had that reputation for being a bit too rough with ladies. Charlie thought that he might even have been involved in a murder a while back. No one really knew for sure. Harrison had enough money to make sure they never knew the truth, or feared enough to look away. Charlie decided to keep an eye on the idiot, and maybe even let the chaperone in on Harrison's little problem, lest he get too eager with Martini. She was a clone, and thus completely expendable, but tonight would go far better if they didn't have to clean up a nasty mess. Mark and Dr. Jones would also be coming as soon as they got out of their meeting, and although Dr. Jones was married, the man never said no to free sex. And Owen had that weird obsession, but he'd be okay with the hooker, as long as Charlie monitored his drinking. And, of course, the bachelor himself, Bruce, would be arriving too. Charlie laughed to himself at the thought of Bruce with the hooker, and then going home to his fiance. That man had balls. Charlie found it weird that they were having this party during a work day. But realistically, that was the only way these men could get away from their families for long enough to have any fun. In this way, he figured, Samantha would never even have to know a thing. He was just working late. Charlie headed for the cocktail waitress to get another shot of whiskey as the men began to arrive. He really should go back to work after this, but he wasn't worried about being drunk. Long ago, a throat spray had been invented that would circumvent that. He just wasn't sure he wanted to go back, especially since this party would probably run well into the evening. He waved at Harrison and Owen as they sauntered in. Inwardly, he sighed. He was getting too old for this. The men hooted and hollered as Martini shoved Bruce down into a folding chair, hard, her painted lips formed a wicked smile as she leaned over him, licking his neck, her fingernails leaving pink welts down his bare chest as she worked her way to his pants. She cracked her whip with her other hand and bit his ear. With practiced grace, she unclasped the belt and reached down into his pants, grabbing the soft swell growing under the high-end fabric of his slacks. She bit his ear again, and was pleased when his swell stiffened, growing longer. She pushed him roughly on the shoulder, causing his chair to topple to the floor. She giggled, suddenly demure, as his legs flailed wildly. It was time. Martini grabbed Bruce by the wrist and pulled him up from the floor. He chased after her, eagerly, as she hauled him into the bedroom for his turn. She would remain there for the rest of the evening, or for as long as she was needed, taking special care of each man for no more than an hour at a time. Before she closed the bedroom door, she nodded to her chaperone, who watched with a sullen smile from the corner of the party. Stephen would be going in and out of the room periodically to check on her and make sure that none of the men got too rough. 
She was a prized clone, after all. There weren't many originals with her talent, or exceptional fake enthusiasm. Charlie watched as Stephen rested his shoulder against the bedroom door to wait. His eyes were on the cocktail waitress, but his demeanor and arguments with Martini earlier showed that he was incredibly protective of her. Charlie shook his head in disgust. Didn't that man know she was just a clone? Mark passed a shot to Charlie and laughed, nodding to the bedroom. Man, remember when we were young and could act like that? Charlie smirked. Please. I've always been the old fart. Got saddled too early with a wife and now I'm paying the consequences. He downed his shot. You're the ultimate ladies' man, Mark. I gotta hand you that. I couldn't even venture a guess at the number of women you've banged and then brought in as originals. Mark's eyes slanted at the comment, but he reached for another shot. He shook his head, suddenly serious. I just meant that I... I feel too old for this kind of thing anymore, you know? I'm not 21 years old. I'm 39. And I'm starting to wish my life had a little meaning, you know? Charlie frowned. He'd never seen this side of Mark before. The ladies' man who wanted to settle down. If he had the opportunity, he'd scoop up Mark's job without giving it a second thought. What do you mean, he asked. Mark shook his head. I'm just tired, Charlie. He sighed and sat on the couch. I wish I had what you had sometimes. With Samantha. She's pretty great. Charlie stared at Mark as the man gazed out the window of the penthouse. He seemed a man defeated, lost without a purpose. As they sat in silence, he began to wonder what might have changed Mark's mind about living the life he was. Mark waved his hand absently. I have to get back to work. Charlie stopped him. Don't you want to stay for a round with the hooker? Mark chuckled. She's nothing to me, so why bother? Just had to show my face here to keep up pretenses with the boss and the boss's son. He looked at Charlie seriously. I'm not sure why you're waiting around, though. Charlie let out a chuckle. The free ride, man. That's why. Mark shook his head in disgust. Good luck with that. Charlie felt rebuffed. Why was Mark acting like this? For so long, they had been bros, taking on events like this with excitement and camaraderie. What's your problem, Mark? Mark turned to leave. Mess up your life. I don't care. You don't deserve her anyway. Seriously? Charlie shouted. You're seriously going to talk to me like that? Mark shook his head, a look of disdain marring his features as he silently walked out of the penthouse. Stephen walked idly among the party guests, taking special note of all the men. He stopped in front of the red-headed man, Harrison, he thought was his name, and studied the man's already drunken sway. He clasped Harrison roughly on the arm, pointedly glancing down at the large, ornate knife clasped to his expensive leather belt. Stephen smiled appreciatively at the foot-long knife and poked a finger at the striking hilt studded in precious stones. Harrison beamed proudly. I got it at an auction, man. Thirty grand. He laughed, taking a long swig from his whiskey, smacking his lips proudly. They didn't know what they had. Nodding in approval, the chaperone dutifully returned to his post near the cocktail waitress. She smiled eagerly, passing him a beer. He could tell by the glint in her eyes how much she wanted him. He grinned back at her, noticing her pleasure from his attention. Maybe he'd take her out after the party. Take her out to a nice dinner. Charlie waited patiently by the bedroom door for Bruce to finish with Martini. He was the bachelor, after all. By rights, Bruce cut first dibs and could take as long as he could manage. Leaning against the wall, Charlie watched in shock as the front door to the penthouse suddenly burst open. 
Bruce's fiance stormed in with mascara running in dark lines down her cheeks. The look in her eyes was frightening. Tracy hastened in after her, carrying her stupid scissors, her eyes wild with what Charlie took to be glee. Hey man, more for us, Harrison yelled, clumsily grabbing for the fiancé's breast. She shoved Harrison aside. Where's Bruce, she screamed, rounding on Charlie, who stood nearest the bedroom. Her eyes squinted in disgust when Bruce's moans and the hooker's gasps of practice passion came clearly through the bedroom door. With fury in her eyes, she snatched Tracy's scissors and rushed towards Charlie, who blocked her path to the bedroom. She raised the scissors in her fist, her scream so shrill, Charlie nearly wet himself. Tracy rushed forward, clearly intent on regaining her scissors back. The fiancé shoved her brutally, and Tracy fell hard, cracking her face on the marble floor of the penthouse. Charlie stared in horror. Tracy didn't move, blood forming in a dark puddle below her. As if in slow motion, the chaperone leaped atop Bruce's fiancé, and both crashed down to the ground. She shrieked and cursed as Stephen roughly seized her arms and held her, her face down on the floor. Charlie realized that she was crying for more than just her rage, and motioned the chaperone to let her up. With wide eyes, he saw that the scissors were sticking strangely out of her upper arm. He groaned. This wasn't good. Without thinking, Charlie pulled the scissors from her arm and immediately started choking on the spurt of warm blood that shot him in the face. Charlie cursed at Stephen. The fool could have killed her. He tore a strip of fabric from his shirt and wrapped it around her arm. She winced her eyes tightly shut and began to sob loudly. He put his arm around her, yelling at Owen to pick up Tracy. Owen seemed stricken by the entire event and awkwardly grasped the limp body in his arms, unwilling to look at her face. Charlie cast a furious glance at the chaperone before ordering Owen to follow with Tracy as he gingerly led the fiancé from the penthouse to the limo that waited on the street below. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams.